This is an ABC podcast. Good morning. Welcome to AM. I'm Sabra Lane. US authorities are insisting they'll continue evacuation efforts in Afghanistan until the very end of the mission next week. At the same time, they're acknowledging during the operation's final days, the focus will shift to getting military resources out of the country. 19,000 people have been evacuated over the past 24 hours, but there's anger in Washington over a decision by two politicians to fly into the country on an unapproved reconnaissance mission. North America correspondent Barbara Miller reports. The numbers sound impressive. In the past uh, 24 hours, we exceeded uh, the previous uh, 24-hour flight departures and evacuation. The operation at Kabul airport is certainly running a lot more smoothly than it was at the outset. That is 90 flights total yesterday. Major General Hank Taylor is the deputy director of the Joint Staff for Regional Operations. Every 39 minutes yesterday, uh, a plane departed uh, Kabul airport. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken is talking up the mission. Since August 14th, more than 82,300 people have been safely flown out of Kabul. Only the United States could organize and execute a mission of this scale and this complexity. But while large numbers do make it to the airport, some cannot navigate the dangerous journey. Major General Hank Taylor confirmed a U.S. helicopter again ventured into Kabul to pick up a group of evacuees. Last night, uh, during the period of darkness, there was an operation to be able to uh, go out and safely uh, evacuate evacuees. Uh, they are at H. Kaya and uh, uh, they're safely there preparing to be evacuated. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby. Uh, we're not going to provide specific details. Less than 20. American? Less than 20. Less than 20. I'm not going to provide additional details. President Biden's insistence that everyone is out by August the 31st means the window of opportunity to leave is closing rapidly because by that date, all US forces, more than 5,000 of them, will have to be out too. There will be a transition more towards getting military assets out as we get closer to the end. But again, uh, we're going to continue to work the evacuation mission right up uh, until the last day. As tens of thousands flee Afghanistan, two U.S. lawmakers jettied in. Representative Seth Moulton, a Democrat, and Peter Meyer, a Republican who both served in Iraq, went into Kabul to conduct what they called oversight of the evacuation. The trouble was they didn't get approval. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby. They certainly took time away from what we had been planning to do that day. We are obviously not encouraging VIP visits, and the secretary, I think, would have appreciated the opportunity to have had a conversation before the visit took place. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi also criticised the clandestine trip, writing a letter to House members telling them not to travel to Afghanistan. This, she said, is deadly serious. This is Barbara Miller in Washington reporting for AM. The Australian government's Smart Traveller website is now urging people not to travel to Kabul Airport, telling them to move to a safe location and wait for further advice. It adds to the growing sense of urgency in the Afghan capital as the US-led evacuation effort enters its final days. South Asia correspondent James Oaten reports. It's been 10 years since Solwyn Leach served in Afghanistan, but the memories are still vivid. Definitely the, the highlight of my military career. The thing that most jumps out would be how much of a beautiful and peaceful place Afghanistan can be. A former captain in the Australian Army, Solomon Leach spent six months in Uruzgan province as an infantry officer and developed a strong bond with the local interpreters. There wouldn't be a soldier or an officer that deployed that would downplay the value of interpreters. There was certainly some very hairy moments that, that these guys were a part of. As the country and capital fell to the Taliban, Solwyn Leach was contacted by two interpreters. Both are in Australia, now with citizenship, but many of their family members remain in Afghanistan. One of the interpreters, who only wants to be known by his nickname, Noor, has told the ABC he's scared that once international forces leave, the Taliban will become more brutal. Salwan Leach has helped Noor submit documents to the Australian government to request visas for his family members, but says he's been unable to get any meaningful response. He hadn't even been provided with a, um, with a case number. Essentially, his, his documents, that are, each one of those is a family member of his. We're talking about his mother, father, 
his sisters and brothers and, and young children who are his nephews and nieces. These people are all sitting in an inbox somewhere and haven't even been assigned a case manager. Jason Skeynes is a former army captain who works for a Labor senator. He set up the organisation Forsaken Fighters to help Afghan interpreters and other staff who served with Australia. He's currently helping about 200 who are stuck in Afghanistan. We've seen uh, visas, uh, 449 visas, which is temporary protection visas, starting to uh, trickle through. But it's really looking like it could be too little too late, uh, to be honest. I'm I'm getting reports uh, just now of the Taliban not letting people through, beating um, women with the butts of rifles, uh, slapping them with pipes. Solomon Leach says the visa process needs to be sped up. We're going to have a small generation of Afghan kids in Australia, potentially, whose grandparents, aunties and uncles and cousins have been butchered overseas. And within their families, at least, it would be good for their parents to be able to tell those children that The Australian government did all it could to help. A spokesperson for the Department of Home Affairs says it can't give a breakdown of how many visas have been approved since the Taliban takeover and how many more are still being processed. Adding that because the emergency evacuation is still underway and lives are in danger, it can't give detailed information at this time. This is James Oten reporting for AM. The New South Wales health system's under incredible strain. Ambulances carrying COVID patients were again forced to queue outside major hospitals overnight. The state set another unenviable Australian record yesterday with 919 local cases. Catherine Gregory reports. Sydney hospitals are again stretched to the limit and some are turning away COVID patients. Overnight, we know that Westmead, Blacktown and the Pian hospitals They stopped receiving COVID-positive patients via ambulance. Liu Bianchi is an intensive care paramedic and delegate for the New South Wales branch of the Australian Paramedics Association. This forced our paramedics to try and find hospitals elsewhere. This caused bed block at hospitals like Concord and Royal North Shore which remain unequipped to deal with the realities of multiple ambulances waiting hours and with confirmed COVID patients. And while patients and paramedics wait, they're faced with some dire conditions. Now, that patient has to lay on that bed, which is not designed to have a patient on there for any more than possibly 60 minutes. Now, that patient will have pressure areas, will be agitated, will be distressed... The paramedics are distressed. So a a paramedic will turn up at a hospital. There is nowhere for them to eat. There is nowhere for them to safely sit and do their paperwork. They cannot get out of the weather. It's unbelievable. It also means paramedics can't even get a drink of water, eat or use a bathroom inside the hospital because they're wearing PPE gear that's been exposed to COVID. New South Wales Health is now setting up makeshift outdoor triage units for some major hospitals to help free up ambulances. But Liu Bianchi says it's not a long-term solution for a strained health system. Those beds are going to fill up as well. Where is the long-term plan here for us to safely take patients to hospital. The Australian Paramedics Association has written a couple of letters to the New South Wales Health Minister, Brad Hazard, asking for more support. That includes things like better PPE, training regional paramedics to help out, better shelter from the weather and rapid antigen testing. At the moment, obviously, there's a turnaround time for having swabs. So the rapid antigen testing would be a far quicker way for paramedics to have a swab, get back on road and keep working. She says so far there's been no response. Meanwhile, Victoria's health system is also under pressure. It's flying in 350 medical staff from overseas. 90% will be doctors, the remainder are specialist nurses or midwives, and they should be on the job by October. The government says many are resident hospital medical officers who will meet staffing demands in emergency departments and other critical areas. Catherine Gregory. 
Parents in New South Wales are anxious to find out when students will be allowed to return to their classrooms. It's understood the plan hasn't been finalised, although there could be some clues later this week. In Victoria, the Education Minister says it's still too early to say when students will go back. As Isabel Rowe reports, teachers, parents and principals in both states are split on when remote learning should end. When it comes to deciding how to get students back to school in a pandemic, everyone has an opinion. The return date is a vexed issue amongst our community because everyone's context is very different. Gail McCarty is Executive Officer of Parents Victoria, which advocates for families at the state's public schools. She says while parents want their children out of home and back in class, many are worried about the spread of COVID amongst the unvaccinated. But there's no consensus yet on who must have the jab before school returns. What we would be saying clearly is that where people can be vaccinated, get vaccinated. Um, But we're very mindful, of course, that we have to respect people's rights and choices in that space. Children in Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT are all doing remote learning. Medical groups like the Royal Australasian College of Physicians are calling for National Cabinet to prioritise getting children back into the classroom as soon as possible, citing mental health concerns. New South Wales Secondary Principals Council President Craig Peterson is pushing for a ban on face-to-face learning until the state reaches an 80% vaccination rate, and that likely won't be before the start of term. If we bring students and staff back too early without adequate protections, we're very concerned that we're going to get uh, clusters of COVID. At the moment, teachers can't be forced to disclose their vaccination status, but many are willingly sharing that information through voluntary surveys conducted by independent schools and the New South Wales Department of Education. Craig Peterson says principals want a clearer picture than that before they return. We do need a better mechanism because as a school principal responsible for the safety and well-being of everybody on the site, having access to that information would would be very valuable. Should there be a public health order mandating vaccines for teachers? We certainly believe that it should be a discussion item. But the Australian Education Union, representing public school teachers, is less inclined to pursue mandatory vaccination. President Karina Haythorpe. We believe that uh, having priority access to vaccines is critically important. At this stage, there is no uh, health advice that says it must be mandated. uh, And therefore, uh, we will address the issue of mandating vaccines um, at an appropriate time. There are also questions about who should wear masks and how classroom ventilation can be improved. In New York, all classrooms must have two air purifiers next year. Craig Peterson from the New South Wales Secondary Principals Council says it's a big undertaking to solve that issue. A very difficult thing to, to, to manage as well, particularly in those areas of the state which are, which are colder. We, we've had snow in the central tablelands um, yesterday and, and this morning. So cross-flow ventilation is only effective if we've got adequate heating, and in a lot of our classrooms, that's simply not the case. That's Craig Peterson from the New South Wales Secondary Principals Council, ending Isabel Rowe's report. The regional city of Shepparton in northern Victoria remains a focus in the state's outbreak, with the number of COVID-positive cases now at 50. With a growing number of exposure sites across the Greater Shepparton region, including several large schools, close to a third of the population is now in isolation. That's putting a huge strain on essential services. Supermarket click and collect orders are being cancelled and pharmacies are relying on volunteers, as Bridget Fitzgerald reports. John Anderson's semi-retired, but this week he's run off his feet taking customer orders and filling scripts. Bridget, I'm a pharmacist of many, many years and and I'm working in the pharmacy that I owned for 39 years. At the moment I'm back to full time because we're short-staffed with pharmacists and the the shop staff as well, not because of any other reason than we've got staff who are isolating at home with their families. There are an estimated 17,000 people in isolation across the Shepparton region. With hundreds of healthcare workers furloughed, teams are being sent up from Melbourne to fill the gaps. Staff shortages have also meant major supermarkets have had to cancel some deliveries and click and collect orders, leaving many without any way to get groceries. People, they don't have the opportunity to buy, so there is a sort of stress around it. 
Khalif Al Salam is a community development officer at the Shepparton Ethnic Council and a leader in the local Iraqi and wider Arab community. Shepparton is one of the most multicultural places in Victoria, and if people can't do their own shopping, appropriate foods near impossible to get. You know, some ethnicities they're having their own shop to buy halal meat, halal uh, chickens, and. Uh, other type of food not available through Coles, Woolworths and other uh, shops. Though there are many volunteering to help out. We give a nice, uh, nice meals for the families, make the meals for the like for adults, we make meals for the kids. Restaurant owner Azem Almez is in the kitchen around 12 hours a day. Not just for his business, he's giving away a lot of his food for free, including halal. He's no stranger to it either. For 30 years, he's been working with local homeless people and running a soup kitchen. Anybody brings me up, we need this. I'll make the hamper. I'll send it away with the volunteers. It's done. I don't have any questions. I don't ask anything. Just just do the job and, and walk away. So that's what it is. Pharmacist John Anderson, who's also the president of the Shepparton Chamber of Commerce and Industry, says he's been overwhelmed by the generosity of volunteers, but the town can't do it on its own. We need volunteers who are able to go out and actually do the shopping for people and deliver it to their homes. And, and of course, though, will you know people families will expect to pay for that pay for the, the produce but i think there's a real a real need there victoria's health minister martin foley says he's aware of the issues and work is being done to address disruptions to food supply meanwhile defence force personnel are being deployed to assist with covid testing and door knocking bridget fitzgerald reporting Keeping the lights on when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine is the great challenge of efforts to decarbonise Australia's electricity systems. In a remote part of Western Australia, a trial's underway that may provide answers on how to generate 100% reliable renewable energy across the country. And it's being watched around the world. Daniel Mercer has the story. Irene Barker knows better than most the value of a reliable electricity supply. It's jolly hot. It gets up to 45. Do you think I don't need air conditioning? She lives in Onslow, a town of 900 people in the Pilbara region of Western Australia's northwest. It's notoriously hot, making air conditioning a costly essential for the 77-year-old. The Christmas before the solar panels, we had a $1,200 power bill for Christmas. I tell you, I nearly fell off the chair. What makes Onslow so hot is also making it a test case that energy experts around the world are watching closely. The Pilbara is one of the sunniest regions on the globe and Onslow's residents have installed solar panels with gusto to take advantage. But having a large amount of solar as part of the town's small power grid was playing havoc with supply. So up until now, you either have unmanaged solar, which therefore is just utilising the system whenever it's on, and that creates a lot of problems from an overall reliability perspective. And that's where you get fluctuations in the power supply, problems at the household and problems at the central station as well. Stephanie Unwin is the Chief Executive of Horizon Power, the state-owned regional power supplier in WA. Until recently, Onslow's power has relied on a gas-fired power plant when the sun isn't shining or demand outstrips supply. But in a bid to shake things up, Horizon has been running a trial to optimise the way solar power is used in the grid, backed by large-scale batteries. Earlier this year, it successfully ran the network on nothing more than solar and batteries for 80 minutes. Horizon Stephanie Unwin compares the system to a highway. What happens with unmanaged solar is it just can go wherever it wants on the road. What we're trying to do with DERMS is actually say, hey, there's a dash line here and most of the time you're fine, but when there's a double line, we really just need you to back off a bit. WA Energy Minister Bill Johnson says nowhere else in the world has been able to achieve 100% renewable energy without the backup of a spinning turbine such as a hydroelectric power plant. This Onslow trial is a genuinely globally important trial. It's being looked at from around the world. And if we can do that here, if we can learn how to do it here in Western Australia, that's technology that can be sold to the world. At home in Onslow, Irene Barker says she's comfortable with a future where the town's power supply is renewable. What do I make of them? I think they're wonderful. <laughs> Onslow resident Irene Barker ending that report from Daniel Mercer. And that's AM for today. Thanks for your company. I'm Sabra Lane. 
Hi, I'm Stephen Smiley, and I'm from the ABC's daily news podcast, The Signal. Every other day is a new worst day for New South Wales at the moment, but the state's Premier Gladys Berejiklian and the Prime Minister Scott Morrison both want to stick to a reopening plan linked to vaccination rates of 70 and 80%. So today on The Signal, why do those national reopening goals that everyone agreed to in July seem to be shifting? And why is the Prime Minister so insistent they must be met? Look for The Signal on the ABC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.